in this lecture, I shall discuss the various X-ray diffraction methods that are available to study materials. There are in general three different X-ray diffraction methods. Now, the three X-ray diffraction methods are the Lave method, the powder method and the rotating crystal method. Now, in the Lave method, the X-ray that is used has a variable wavelength. That means, in this method, we use a white radiation from the X-ray tube. The sample in this case is a single crystal as a result of which theta, the angle of incidence of X-rays on an atomic plane is fixed. In the powder method, we use a single or monochromatic wavelength from the X-ray tube by using the appropriate filter. Normally, in this method, we can examine a polycrystalline sample and in the polycrystal, there are plenty of crystals available and therefore, there will be many, many atomic planes which will be in a position to diffract and we can have a variable theta or angle of incidence. In the rotating crystal method, wavelength is a monochromatic wavelength, theta is variable and we can examine a single crystal. Now, out of these three, I will discuss only the first two, namely the Lave and the powder methods. Now, so far as the Lave method is concerned, it has got two variations. One is known as 
the transmission Lawe method, the other one is known as the back reflection Lawe method. So far as the powder method is concerned, there are three variations. One is known as the Debye-Scherer method, then comes the focusing method. And thirdly, the pinhole method. So, Lawe method has got two variations the transmission Lawe and the back reflection Lawe. The powder method has three variations the Debye focusing, and pinhole methods. We will describe these methods one after another. Now, this diagram shows the arrangement that we have in the transmission Lawe method and the back reflection Lawe method so far as the X ray source, the sample, and the film to record the diffraction are concerned. In the transmission Lawe method, we use a single crystal at the at a central location. From one side, X-rays are allowed to fall on this single crystal and depending on which of the HKL planes in the single crystal that are poised for diffraction according to Bragg's law, we will get a large number of diffracted beams traveling from the sample towards a photographic film which is kept at one end. So, this is the photographic film. This is wrapped in a black paper so that photographic film is not affected by ordinary light. In the back reflection Lawe method, as we can see, the photographic film is kept at the central location, excess pass through the film and fall on the single crystal and all the diffracted radiations at the back side, they are recorded on the photographic film. Now, so far as the powder method is concerned, I have already said that there are three different methods like the debye method, the focusing method and the pinhole method. Now, here I have given a cross section of the debye camera, so to say. Now, you see in this method, we put a needle like sample here. We put a needle like sample here made up of a large number of crystallites from the material to be examined. Now, there is a film wrapped in this manner in the inside of a cylindrical light tight camera, the X radiation falls on the sample and the diffracted radiation is recorded on this film. Now, this film after exposure is over is taken to a dark room, developed and fixed and dried and then all those diffracted spots analyzed. In the focusing method, we use a camera of this type 
again it's a light tight camera and here instead of putting the specimen in the form of a needle at the center we put a specimen on the surface on the surface of the camera and the recording film is wrapped in a larger part of the surface too and the x-ray source lies on the surface. So, in this case the x-ray source specimen and the recording film are both lying on one circular area. Now, in case of the pinhole method there are two variations one is called the transmission pinhole the another is called the back reflection pinhole. So, in this case we can have a big thin sample made up of large number of crystals the x-rays will go through the sample and produce diffracted radiation to be recorded in a film on this side and all the diffracted radiation the backward side will be recorded on a film placed in this position. This one is known as the transmission pinhole type, this one is known as the back reflection pinhole type. So, when we talk about all the different methods in more detail, this is the transmission Lawe method, x-ray source from the x-ray source x-ray of consisting of white radiation we know that in the Lawe method we need a large number of wavelengths. Why we need a large number of wavelengths? Because in this method you see we have a single crystal specimen to be examined and once a single crystal specimen is fixed we know that the angles with respect to the incident radiation for the different HKL planes they are also going to be fixed and there may be a possibility that none of those atomic planes are in a position to diffract. So, if you use a single wavelength x radiation then the chances are none of the atomic planes in the single crystal specimen may be satisfying Bragg's law that is lambda is equal to 2d sin theta. In that case no diffraction will occur, but when we study a material by x-ray diffraction we naturally want to have some diffraction taking place because only by examining the diffracted radiation we shall be able to find out crystallographic information of the material being examined. So, that is the reason why in the Lawe method we use a white radiation consisting of a large number of wavelengths. The idea is if a particular wavelength cannot get diffracted from a particular HKL plane then some other wavelength may satisfy Bragg condition and get diffracted. So, in order to improve the chances of diffraction to occur from the single crystal sample we use a white radiation or heterochromatic radiation or multiple wavelength radiation in this case. Now, C is a collimator. Collimator, the function of a collimator is uh, to make the incident x-ray beam as parallel as possible. In most of the cases you will find that the x-ray beam coming out of the x-ray source they are divergent type. So, in order to have a more or less parallel beam of x-rays we use a device called the collimator whose function is to make the rays more or less parallel to one another. So, this collimated rays will fall on the sample x over here and y is the specimen holder. Now, from you know part of the radiation will pass through the sample and strike the film at the central spot. This is the transmitted beam, this is the transmitted beam and this S stands for a beam stop you use a heavy metal you know stop. So, that it stops here you know say for example, if some lead or lead glass is used then it cannot go out on this side. 
because X rays are dangerous. And the various diffracted beams, they will uh, fall on the film at different places. So, from for a particular diffracted beam, we know the length r1 from the center and we also know the distance d between the specimen and the film and therefore, we can find out what is the value of 2 theta. You remember that 2 theta is always the angle between the incident and the diffracted beam. So, for each spot 2 theta value can be found out and from that the theta value which is nothing but the angle of incidence of X radiation on a particular atomic plane can be found out. Now, in the transmission Lawe method, the material must be very, very thin so that X rays can pass through. If the sample is very thick, then what will happen? Practically, no diffracted beam will come out in the forward direction. So, in order to have a you know diffracted beams coming out in the forward direction, your sample must be thin enough so that the X rays can easily pass through. On the other hand, it may so happen the, that the material is not that thin, it is a thick material. In that case, what will happen? The the, there will be no diffraction can be recorded in the forward direction and only those which are diffracted in the backward direction can be detected. So, in this particular case what happens? We allow the x-ray source to pass through you know the x-ray from an x-ray source to pass through the collimator and through the center of the uh, uh, through a hole in the center of the film to strike the single crystal and all the rays which are diffracted in the backward direction, they can be recorded on the film here. So, we know that for a particular diffraction spot over here, this is the value of 2 theta. So, this angle here is 180 degree minus 2 theta. This distance can be measured on the film. So, you know this from the measured distance, and the given distance here from the specimen to the film, you can find out the value of theta easily. You see, again going back to the transmission Lawe method, there may be atomic planes which are poised to diffract in the backward direction also. So, you can have both diffraction from forward as well as backward direction and depending on that you can collect all the information in the forward direction or in the backward direction too. Now, the kind of diffracted spots that are obtained in the transmission Lawe method and in the back reflection Lawe method are shown in this diagram. Now, if you look at the spots the, you can find the spots lie on the surface of ellipses or hyperbolas in the two cases. So, the spots will lie on ellipses or hyperbolas. Now, we can find out why this is so. Say for example, when we use the transmission Lawe method, the incident x-rays fall on the crystal and all the planes which form a zone, we know that a number of planes if they are individually parallel to a particular direction, then we say that those planes form a zone and the direction with which each one of them is parallel is known as the zone axis. Now, it so happens that when we look at the diffracted radiation from a number of planes which form a zone, 
the diffracted radiation from all those planes belonging to a zone come out in the form of a cone of radiation. Okay? This is a cone of radiation, this is, you know, uh, this is the base this is, and it emanates from this point. So, if we consider a number of planes that form a zone, then if we find out the diffracted radiation from all the planes in a particular zone, then we find that the diffracted radiation comes out in the form of a cone like this. And when it gets recorded, you know, on the film, it appears as a, in the, appears in the form of a, uh, it appears in the form of a circle. So, when this beam of radiation, a diffracted radiation intersects the film, then they come out, the intersection comes out in the form of an ellipse like this. And this angle, you know, this is the zone axis of that particular zone of planes which give rise to this diffracted ellipse. So, this is true in case of the transmission Lawe method. Now, when we look at the back reflection Lawe method, again you see that from a zone of planes, the diffracted radiation will come out in the form of a cone. You know, this is the base of the cone, it will emanate from this point. And if you look at the diffracted beams, they will form, if you join the diffracted points on the film, they come out in the form of a hyperbola. Now, looking at the diffracted radiation from the single crystal, we always find that even though the incident radiation, which is a divergent one in most of the cases, it has a cross section which is circular in nature, you know, after they are diffracted by a series of similar atomic planes and they get focused to a point F over here and the cross section automatically will not be a spherical one like in case of the incident radiation. The reason is, you know, because they are not parallel, they are incident at slightly different Bragg angles on the planes and as a result of which due to the focusing action when they are focused at a particular point cross section looks like an ellipse. So, that is why you will find that the spots you know uh, are no longer spherical in case of the in the Lawe diffraction. Now, let us come to the powder method. In the powder method the most important method is the Debye-Scherer method. Now, what happens in the Debye-Scherer method? In the Debye-Scherer method, we use a camera which has the shape of a flat cylinder. So, this is the flat cylindrical camera and it is covered by a light tight cover. So, the specimen is placed right at the center and specimen is a needle shaped specimen. How we produce the needle shaped specimen? We have to remember that here we examine not a single crystal, but a polycrystalline material. So, one way of making a needle shaped specimen is to produce some fine powder from the sample by filing and then by coating a very thin glass fiber with that powder using glue or petroleum jelly. So, what we do? First, we produce a fine powder from the polycrystalline sample by filing the sample and then we take a very fine glass fiber, coat it with glue or petroleum jelly and then coat it with 
the powder. So, the powder will adhere to the very thin glass fiber and then it can be used as a sample. The other method is you produce a some powder from the polycrystalline sample, then take some thin walled glass tube, very very thin walled glass tube made up of a non absorbing material like cellophane or lithium borate glass and fill it up with the powder that can be used as the sample or if you have a very thin polycrystalline sheet of a material with a pair of scissors you can cut out a thin uh, length you know small length of very thin uh, and small length and that can be used as the sample. Now, normally for Debeisserer method the needle shaped sample should be about 0 0.5 millimeter diameter should be 0 0.5 millimeter in diameter and about 1 or 1.5 centimeter in length. So, the needle shaped specimen for powder photography has approximately 0.5 millimeter diameter and say about 1 to 1.5 centimeter in length. Now, if we look in this camera, so this is where this specimen is fixed on the specimen holder, x-rays pass through a hole made over here and x-ray direct x-ray comes out through a hole over here. Now, this is what is known as the beam stop and here you have a heavy metal for example, uh, uh, lead glass to stop the direct beam. Now, here we have got what is known as film tightener. You see, it we produce, we, we keep, you know, for recording the diffracted radiation, we use a film which is put tightly around the inside of the camera. So, a thin strip of film is kept inside the camera and it is tightened, it is tightened by what is known as a film tightener. So, this is the description of the type of camera we use in the Debeisserer method. The point to be remembered is because we are dealing with uh, films which are affected by ordinary light, the whole you know the uh, positioning of the film etcetera must be carried out in a dark room, so that the film does not come in contact with ordinary light and then the cover should be tightly put and after the exposure is over, the whole camera is taken in the dark room, developed, fixed and dried in the usual manner. Now, in the powder method, we have a large number of crystallites, thousands or sometimes even millions of crystallites. So, the chances are that a particular HKL plane in quite a number of these crystallites will be poised for diffraction with respect to the single wavelength x-ray that is incident on it. So, in this method we use a monochromatic radiation and since the number of crystallites is many maybe many thousands or even millions of crystallites in the powder sample, it will so happen that there will be at least a few of the crystallites for which say the HKL plane will be in a position to diffract the incident X radiation. Say for example, this is a particular case, say this is an HKL plane which is having an angle of incidence theta with respect to the incident X radiation. So, the X ray if it you know follows Bragg's law 
x ray will be diffracted in this direction. This is the angle 2 theta between the direction of incidence and the direction of diffraction. Now, in another crystal, the h k the same h k l plane may, may be lying in this fashion and what will happen after diffraction it will be coming out in this direction so you see if we rotate this h k l plane around this point you know, at this point around the direction of the incident x ray then all possible uh, locations of the same h k l plane in many many crystallites will be found out. So, what will happen if you look at the diffraction taking place from all the h k l planes from the different crystallites they will come out as a locus they will come out as a cone of radiation it will come out as a cone of radiation. Say for example, if we have Say for example, in a particular crystallite, the h k l plane makes this angle theta with the incident radiation and suppose the incident radiation lambda is such that lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta, this Bragg's relationship is fulfilled. So, we will have a diffracted ray making the same angle theta going in this direction. Say in another crystallite it may so happen that the same h k l plane is positioned in this manner and still it makes the angle theta with the incident radiation. Say for example, you have the same h k l type of plane in another crystallite which lies like this making the same angle theta with the incident radiation. So, what will happen in that case? You will have the, ins the diffracted radiation coming out in this fashion. So, if you look at the locus of all the diffracted radiation coming out from the same h k l plane in as many crystals as possible, say for example, in one crystal the h k l plane may be making an angle theta with the incident radiation and the diffracted radiation come out in this direction. So, if you consider all the diffracted radiation from a particular type of h k l planes from many many crystals you will find that the whole diffracted radiation will come out in the form of a cone. So, the whole x radiation diffracted radiation will come out in the form of a cone of radiation. So, the whole diffracted intensity you know from all the diffracted beams coming out from the same plane h k l from many many crystallites present in the sample will come out in the form of a cone of radiation. Now, so this is the situation we have the a particular type of h k l plane making the correct angle for Bragg diffraction in one of the crystallites considering many many other crystallites where also this h k l plane 
is in a condition to diffract looking at all the diffracted beams from this particular type of plane we will find that the diffracted intensity will come out in the form of a cone. Now, if we have a thin photographic film placed in this manner, then what will happen? All the cones of radiation will get intercepted on this film. For example, this particular cone will intercept the X-ray film at this point and at this point. This um, you know cone of radiation will intercept the film at this point and also at this point. Similarly, this particular film you know cone of radiation will intercept the film X on the film here as well as here. So, as a result when we look at when we take out the film develop and fix it then we find that the recording film looks like this. These are the holes one for the collimator through which the X-rays get into the chamber and this is the beam stop region. So, these two holes correspond to the collimator where through which the incident X-ray beam comes and this is the beam stop region. So, in the, this is another hole and the diffracted radiation in the form of cones they intercept the film on these lines over here. So, the entire diffracted radiation is not recorded on the film because the film is a narrow strip. Otherwise, the entire diffraction cones would have been recorded over there. So, so far as the we are concerned, we will get a film of this type on which the diffracted radiation from a particular HKL plane will come as a line pair. So, these two lines will come from this de Weichera ring which is due to diffraction from a particular plane only, but so far as the recording is concerned it will be recorded as two distinct lines a line pair so to say. For another HKL plane from the polycrystal material the diffracted radiation again will be recorded as another line pair. In this manner a third HKL plane the diffraction from it will be recorded as a line as a line pair and for another as a line pair etcetera etcetera. In some cases where they diffracted say for example, if we have a diffracted cone which cuts the film at this point. So, instead of two lines we will have a single line. So, it will appear like this. So, this is a schematic diffraction lines on the films as we record it. Now, this end through which the x-ray enter naturally 2 theta is 180 degree. You must remember 2 theta is the angle between the incident and the diffracted direction and here at this point 2 theta is 0 degrees. Now, <coughs> whenever we deal with a de Weichera camera, one very important thing to understand is what is the resolving power of the camera. Now, what we mean by a resolving power of a camera? Say for example, if it so happens that the two HKL planes which diffract the radiation from many many crystallites say the HKL planes are having very very close interplanar distance. So, say we have a situation where say we have two planes H1, K1, L1 and H2, K2, L2 in the material. So, the H1, K1, L1 planes from many of the crystallites in the powder sample, they will diffract the radiation and the diffracted cone will be recorded 
partly on the X-ray film. Similarly, say the H2, K2, L2 planes in many of the crystal lives, they will also diffract the radiation and the diffracted radiation will be recorded as a part on the X-ray film. Say for example, this is the situation. This is where 2 theta is 0 degrees, this is where 2 theta is equal to 180 degrees. Say for example, we have got a diffraction from H1, K1, L1 planes. Say these blue lines, they give you this line pair stands for diffraction from the H1, K1, L1 planes. And say from the H2, K2, L2 planes, after diffraction, we get this line pair. Now, if it so happens that the interplanar distance of the H1, K1, L1 planes, which is say D1, and the interplanar distance of the H2, K2, L2 planes, which is say D2, if D1 and D2 are very, very close, if D1 and D2 are very, very close, then what happens? Lambda is equal to 2D sin theta. The Bragg's law tells us that if D of the two planes are very, very close, since lambda is a fixed quantity, then what will happen? These thetas will also be very, very close. So, the two cones of radiation from this plane and that plane, they will be almost similar. As a result, the, it so happens that the distance between the two lines will be so small that it may be difficult to identify the two lines from the two planes as separate lines. So, what property of the X-ray camera will determine that, well, in one case, the two lines from the two planes with very similar D values can be seen as distinct lines. So, that will depend on what is known as the resolving power of the camera. So, we define the resolving power by a term d by delta d. So, what is d? d is the average spacing of the two sets of planes that we are considering here. So, d is the average spacing of these two. And what is delta d? Delta d is the difference between their spacing. So, we have got d is equal to d1 plus d2 by 2, the average spacing and delta d is nothing but the difference between the two d's, d1 minus d2 as for in this case. So, d is the average spacing of the two sets of planes and delta d is the difference between their spacings. Now, we will find out an expression for this quantity, the resolving power of the camera. Now, how we do it? Say for example, this is the geometry of a Debye-Scherer camera. This is just a cross section. This is where we have got the needle sample perpendicular to plane of the figure. This is the direction of the incident radiation. This is the direct where the direct radiation goes out and say this is a diffracting plane making the correct Bragg angle. So, there will be a diffraction along this. Now, this distance can be measured on the film 
after the exposure is over. Now, say this distance is s. So, we can write it s is equal to r, r is the radius of the camera into 2 theta. 2 theta is the angle between the incident and the diffracted beam. So, s is equal to r into 2 theta or delta s is r delta 2 theta. What is delta 2 theta? This is the angle that separates the diffracted beams produced by two sets of planes having nearly the same spacing. So, in this case say you have the diffracted beam from this plane having say the interplanar distance d 1 over here and if you have another plane d 2 very close to it maybe this line will be somewhere here very close to it. So, delta theta you can calculate from the position of the two diffracted lines. So, delta 2 theta is the angle that separates the diffracted beams produced by two sets of planes having nearly the same spacing. And what is delta s? This is a separation of these two lines on the film. So, for one set of planes, if this is the where the diffracted radiation intercepts, maybe the other one the diffracted radiation intercepts very close to it and thus distance is delta s. Now, the Bragg's law states the lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta. So, if we differentiate both sides with respect to theta, we come to this kind of a situation or if we write d d d theta is equal to minus d cotangent theta or d theta d d will be minus 1 by d tan theta, but we know that d theta is d s by 2 r because s is equal to r 2 theta where r is the radius of the camera. So, we can write d s d d is equal to minus 2 r by d tan theta. Now, we know that the resolving power is d by delta d. So, we can write d by delta t is equal to minus 2 r divided by delta s tan theta. The negative value here does not have any meaning. So, the resolving power here can be taken as 2 r divided by delta s tan theta. So, how you increase the resolving power? The resolving power can be increased by increasing the r. Please remember the negative value here does not have any meaning at all. So, the resolving power can be increased simply by increasing r. That means, the diameter of the cylindrical camera bigger it is better will be the resolution. So, this is what we find in case of a DS or de Scherer camera. Again we know that D is the mean spacing of the two sets of planes and delta D is the difference in their spacing.